A government scientist says he's seen excess heat and tritium from his own duplications of the pond Fleischmann experiments. But adds, because of the political controversy, he hesitates to call it cold fusion. Dr. James McBreen of the Brookhaven National Laboratory in New York says he began his own experiments after the March 23rd announcement in Salt Lake, but says because of the resistance from many of his colleagues, he hasn't felt comfortable asking for additional funds. No, I didn't try. It was, uh, like a lot of people, uh, like undergo personality transformations when they discuss this topic. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so, uh, no, I didn't try. And Dr. Breen says without that funding, most cold fusion dabblers are simply bootlegging their own experiments, while the Japanese are spending the big bucks exploring the science. I think a lot of people have the attitude that uh, later on we can buy the technology or import it or what have you. McBreen addressed researchers at the University of Utah's National Coal Fusion Institute. Some people believe one scientist may be two years ahead of everyone else with his controversial cold fusion experiments, but that scientist will not be coming to this week's conference in Salt Lake City. The nuclear engineer from the University of Florida has been dabbling in cold fusion since the Pond's Fleischmann announcement last year. But he says for right now, he can't say much to his colleagues. We have details now from science specialist Ed Yates. In their lab at Utah's Cold Fusion Institute, Stanley Pons and Martin Fleischmann say enough scientists are dabbling in these controversial experiments that anyone at any time might come up with some answers. And I've always said it may be the man in the garage somewhere who succeeds. You see, uh, nobody is better than anybody else in this game. When there is a new piece of research, it may be somebody in the garage. And we know of one man whom we respect very highly. And who, who may, may have it. Who may have it. <laughs> We're concerned. We are concerned. Is 80-year-old Glenn Shesu a professor emeritus from the University of Florida, the man in the garage? Martin Fleischmann visited his lab and believes this veteran nuclear engineer may have something. Shesso told Eyewitness News he can turn his experiments on and off at will with 100% reproducibility. He's operated his cells up to 250 degrees Fahrenheit, enough to make steam under pressure. He now controls the energy, dictating how much heat the cells will produce at any given time. While others argued, Chesu says he kept plugging away until he found what he was looking for. The Cold Fusion Institute would like to bring Chesu here to see if what he claims is really true. But Shetu has applied for his own patents, and he says he can't do or say much until that's resolved within 30 days. Shetu's aging, but he's no amateur. His claims are backed with 27 years' experience in the nuclear industry and 32 years in research at the University of Florida. But many scientists remain skeptical, since his work right now is more secrecy than fact they can see, touch, and test in their own labs. At Yates Eyewitness News, Salt Lake City. And from Cold Fusion. The day before an international conference in Salt Lake City, Nature Magazine today attacked cold fusion research with a study from the U's own backyard. We have the story now from science specialist Ed Yates. The University of Utah physicists reported they found no evidence of a nuclear reaction after monitoring experiments inside the Pons Fleischmann lab for five weeks. But the study is eight months old and was submitted to Nature magazine last August when we originally reported the story. Dr. Michael Solomon and his colleagues admit the Nature publication is dated, but they still believe the evidence will eventually support what they observed last year, even when the cells were producing heat. In analyzing our data, we've determined that uh, known fusion processes could not have contributed to that significant heat excess. Dr. Ed Wren, who worked with Mike Solomon on the study, says he also recently visited scientists in India, and even there, he's not convinced a nuclear event is producing the excess heat. They've reported some tritium production, but their neutron signature has the wrong ratio to tritium to come from a DD fusion reactions. So I find the other data that's showing up uh, perplexing, but it does not convince me that uh, fusion has been seen. In part, physicist Haven Bergeson agrees with his colleagues, but his group, which now measures X-rays from new experiments at the Cold Fusion Institute, is not about to rule out the possibility of an unknown reaction no one has seen before. 
if they're real, if they survive the various kinds of tests we're applying to it, um, then I think it's very hard to account for them in any conventional way, and you need something new to explain it. So on the eve of Utah's fusion conference, one year after the controversial announcement, the debate hasn't changed much. Ed Yates, Eyewitness News, Salt Lake City. Cold fusion bashing has become a national pastime for some. Tomorrow, a cold fusion conference will convene right here in Salt Lake City. And some say it's convening to promote the continuing myth. Utah has invested $5 million to find out if what some people are calling a fairy tale can come true. Robert Bazell takes a look. The National Cold Fusion Institute now occupies a prominent place on the campus of the University of Utah. Inside are labs, where scientists are still using the tiny electrical cells to generate what many hoped would be a new source of cheap energy. The building and the labs already have used up two of the five million dollars that the Utah legislature appropriated for cold fusion. <laughs> Dr. Stanley Pons and Martin Fleischman, the two men who started the cold fusion craze a year ago, have not talked openly to the press in months. But in an interview with a local paper, Pons said recently he will be vindicated. The man who heads the institute also believes. I have absolutely no doubts that cold fusion phenomena have been observed in the institute and in the chemistry department combined. But most of the world's scientific establishment believes cold fusion is a dead issue, despite the continued optimism and the meeting starting tomorrow. Dr. Robert Park speaks for the main organization of American physicists. Uh, the, the corpse keeps twitching, and they're, uh, in fact, having a seance in Salt Lake City this week, in which uh, uh, a group of true believers, a, a hardy band of the remaining few, uh, are going to meet and, uh, uh, and congratulate each other on their progress over the recent months. But in fact, there's very little new that I think will take place at that meeting. The believers are not just Pons and Fleischmann. In this laboratory at Stanford, a researcher claims these cells continue to churn out excess heat. And in this lab at Texas A&M, chemists say they are detecting the radioactive form of hydrogen called tritium, which could be a byproduct of fusion. But attempts to repeat these experiments in other laboratories have consistently failed. And most scientists now believe the measurements of heat and tritium are simply mistakes. A panel of scientists convened by the Department of Energy visited many labs and concluded there is no evidence for cold fusion. Why then do some scientists and institutions persist? You build up a sort of constituency, a constituency of scientists who have committed their reputation, politicians who have voted public funds to support it, research managers who have committed the resources of their institutions. All these people have sort of an interest in having the issue not quite settled. And though some will say the matter is not quite settled, it is a safe bet that cold fusion will soon bubble off into oblivion. Bazell today said he's not doing any more stories on cold fusion. He equates the quest for cold fusion in Utah to Elvis sightings.